coming up on this admittedly highbrow and at times overly intellectual YouTube channel, opening the floor to you, the fake name troll and somewhat less malicious kook in the comments feed, whom I love in, of course, a wholly platonic way. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpo.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Straight out of me. Website. Card. Now, if you don't mind, I might just scarper off and get Uma Thurman's yellow spandex jumpsuit and the katana off the boardroom wall and have at it with the creme de la creme of nut de la nut from the YouTube comments feed. This video is brought to you by Olight. Olight makes the best torches I've ever used and I carry one every day. It's this increasingly abused Warrior Mini 2, which has been so incredibly useful and totally reliable, which is why I have no hesitation whatsoever recommending Olight to you. A man cannot own too many Olights, of course, it's physically impossible. The April sale is on now, fortuitously, until Friday the 21st at midnight with big discounts across the range. Link in the description for that. The mighty Marauder Mini, which bridges the gap between being a search and rescue spotlight and a campsite friendly floodlight by basically excelling at being both. The Baton 3 Pro now with its magnesium alloy chassis making it one of the lightest, brightest torches money can buy. The Perrin 2 Mini, it's a pint sized handbag friendly mini torch, perfect for the red carpet perhaps, and it morphs seamlessly into a head torch when the Uber breaks down on the way home. Swivel Pro, just put one in the car dude, it's a super versatile torch and a work light, in my view the ultimate torch and work light combination. And the Warrior 3S. When the world turns on a sixpence and the next stop on the bus is zombie apocalypse, all you're going to need is Mila Jovovich and a Warrior 3S. It really is that simple. I did an in-depth explainer video about choosing the right Olight earlier in the week. The right one depends upon you, basically, and exactly what you need. So I'll put a link kind of up there somewhere. The better to remove the burden of choice from your Olight deliberations. Links to all of these Olights in the description also, plus a code for 12% off on non-sale items and for use outside the sale. And thanks very much to Olight for sponsoring this episode. A baker's dozen of export grade feedback, or is that feedbacks? Whatever. From the nutbag City Limits, that is the YouTube comments feed cesspit today. And unlike Paul Keating, I don't plan on doing any of them slowly. First cab off the rank, a chap or chapette named Buncha. Buncha goes, most university degrees are worthless, completed by people who don't want to work. Is that so, Buncha? Allow me to respectfully retort that every day you use the internets and Wi-Fi and GPS, your smartphone, you travel from A to B in a car, perhaps you get in a lift or go over a bridge, and if you tragically come down with some serious illness, there'll be positron emission tomography and advanced medical therapies available to you. So it seems to me that for people who don't want to work, the highly educated seem to get rather a lot of shit done, often thanklessly, and at least it seems to me that they punch, you know, well above their weight. Now, a person or personette who calls themselves of the gaps is next, and I'm sensing dreadlocks and hemp. With this one, I really am. It's about that greenie who was apported, apported and appointed to a seat on the Volkswagen supervisory board. Not because she's a greenie, not because she's uneducated, but mainly because she's the deputy leader of a coalition in government in the state of Lower Saxony in Germany. I'll put a link to the full story up there. It's quite interesting. Of the gaps goes, as a proud car hater myself... 
Why are you watching, dude? I wish more of us were put into positions of power. The world would be a cleaner, quieter, healthier and all round more pleasant place to exist if we were. Meanwhile, back on Earth, hydrocarbons are the best thing that has ever happened to humanity. If you look at the average human life BH compared with the average human life AH, they're starkly different and AH is better. Trust me on this. Like, look at the course of an average human life in the developed world. Mommy goes into labour and daddy rushes mommy to a hospital in a car, car built of steel, which can't happen without hydrocarbon energy, and uh, it drives on roads made of hydrocarbon energy and uh, made of hydrocarbons, and the car is powered, of course, by hydrocarbon energy. Mommy is in labour in air-conditioned comfort, listening to her favourite tunes, and this is different to giving birth if you were a, I don't know, Viking in the 12th century or something. So there's that. And then when a baby is born in the developed world, of course, it's in a tray thing I wrapped in a blanket, but in a tray made of hydrocarbons. And then 80 years later, at the end of that person's life, they get perhaps cremated by hydrocarbon energy. And in between, they have several meals, many meals, those meals are not possible without hydrocarbon energy. It's hydrocarbon fertiliser is the only thing that makes the production of all the food that we take for granted possible and the food would not get to the supermarket without hydrocarbon energy and it could not actually be farmed without hydrocarbon energy. So there's that to consider. So life, death, everything in between hydrocarbons. Before hydrocarbons, every human had to bust their ass endlessly in every waking moment just to feed themselves if they weren't a pharaoh or a king or something, in which case they had other humans busting their asses by proxy sort of thing. So hydrocarbons are the best thing that's ever happened. And if you go back into the olden days of Australia, which is not like the olden days of Europe, let's not forget, but it's still pretty old by you know, current standards. The first settlement in uh, the core network of Shitsville there in Sydney, right near the um, Sydney Harbour, Farm Cove was what I was trying to think of. And then they went out to Para, they went out to Para in the west to uh, breed the first bogans, but also to have the first viable farms out there on the black sort of silt flat plains there. And it, it was 30 kilometres. And if you had to get from Para, to the core network of Shitsville, then that was kind of arduous because, you know, if you were just a dude who had to make that trip, you had to find a horse. And riding a horse is kind of physical activity. 30 kilometres of horse riding is not for the faint-hearted. Of course, if it was a family that had to do the same trip, then you'd need a carriage and, you know, you'd have to park the horse and carriage somewhere and they'd sting you for that. And it was just unpleasant. These days you can just get into a car and do it in air-conditioned comfort in... 45 minutes or something, as long as you're not in the peak. So this business about the world being cleaner, quieter, healthier and all round more pleasant is unmitigated green bullshit fantasy, dude. Surfer Rossa is next. Also, uh, gender unknown, not that it matters. If you're a nut, you're just part of a club and your gender doesn't matter. You're part of a club nut. I like riding my bike and sandwich meat that has the anus and snout bits kept to a minimum. Yes, but the, the key there is you do need just the Goldilocks amount of export grade anus and snout to make luncheon meat. Luncheon meat. Otherwise, it's just a, a shallow substitute. Nobody really wants that. Perhaps I too could get myself a board seat in the same company. He's not about the same thing. I am a middle-aged straight white male. It's not going to help, is it? You know, which seems to be frowned upon these days. And I also finished my uni degree. Too double whammy. So it probably rules me out straight off the bat. Now, okay, so Volkswagen did put that relatively uneducated, like she never finished uni. She's a greenie and she hates cars. And uh, she's got a seat on the board of the supervisory board of the world's 
whatever number two car company or three or whatever it is. And that's simply because the government of Lower Saxony is a major shareholder and that affords them duos seats on the Volkswagen Supervisory Board. That's the only reason she's there. It's not because she's a greenie or a woman or uneducated or any of that shit. So they didn't really have a choice. That's just how it is. But as to being a snout and anus minimum lunch and eat meeting well-educated white middle-aged male. I think we all have to lighten up on that because the last thing we want to do is do what every other group in society does, which is just, here's my victim card, right? We've got to shoulder that burden. The white middle-aged, highly educated male is the only group in the community tough enough, tough enough to bear the brunt of society's outrage and indignity and inequity and all of those things because it's all aimed at us. It's all our fault, apparently. That and our ancestors. Everyone else would cave in if they were forced to bear this incredible burden, right? They're also obsessed with their feelings and being outraged over shit that absolutely doesn't matter in the course of engineering a better future for humanity. Like, feminists and every other activist group, like, I'll give feminists the time of day. No problem. I love feminists, but I'm not going to entertain their more batty beliefs until we start strenuously advocating for equality among bricklayers. That's what I want to see. Not enough women bricklayers now. That is unacceptable. We need to fix it. Gary... <coughs> now, that's hard to pronounce. It's even harder to spell, incidentally. It's counterintuitive. He says... To your right, there is a machined block of steel with an array of drilled holes that we, the viewer, well, that's an interesting turn of phrase, can see through the array is 3 by 15. Uh, not really, it's 3 by 5, but there you go, close enough, I suppose. There's actually 21 holes, I think. There's 15 in the face and 5 on the side there and uh, 23 holes and 3 on the uh, end. So... It's 23 holes in total. Five of them, I think, are tapped, drilled and tapped for 3816 UNC, if memory serves. Well, I noticed that the holes in that array are not round. They appear to be elliptical in shape. Do, 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 do. Rod Serling will be along to discuss that at any minute, anyway. Possibly this is caused by distortion of the aspect ratio of the video. No, dude, it's caused by perspective distortion by virtue of the wide-angle lens. Like, the closer you get to the edges of the frame and uh, the closer you get to the lens, the more profound the distortion. Like, my hands are not really that big in relation to my head, but using the high-tech miracle of the wide-angle lens, anything is possible. Making... Anyway, talks about this distortion. He says, making you appear... My apologies if this triggers your sense of events... Shorter and wider. I'm not offended by that. I am shorter and wider. <laughs> it's how I roll, dude. Not sure this is the image you're trying to project, but good on you if you're not concerned by this unfortunate consequence of technology. Cheers. Thanks a lot for pointing that out, Gary. That's, uh, that's really buoyed me up today. Good thing I'm a straight, white, middle-aged, highly educated male, I can roll with that. The slings and arrows. And I'm not even outraged, dude. Like... The blocks. The reason Gary's in, right, is the blocks. You need four of these. Four of these. These one, two, three blocks. They're one inch by two inch by three inch. Precision, ground and hardened miracle of engineering, and they're really, really, really cheap. So get yourself four. In fact, I've got ten, because you can get a ten-pack, and they're really good. Okay, so let me just lay down for you why you need ten of these. And I'll put a link to some one, two, three blocks in the description if you're interested. You can get metric ones too, 25 by 50 by 75. So why do you want them? Well... 
they're a fantastic precision square that is just resistant to being damaged and also just really easy to deploy to check something. So if you want to check whether this is square or not, that's pretty easy. Now you can do that with a circular saw to check that the blade is orthogonal to the table, right? You could do this as a drilling guide. If you're drilling a hole in a piece of wood or a piece of steel and it's got to go in at 90 degrees, you can just put the corner near the hole, clamp it down if necessary, if it's going to be shaken all over, and then just drill in line with this hole. And you can also use them as shims if you want to get something up off your welding table, such as the side of the thing that you've already welded, which has the weld beads on it underneath, or the tacks or something. Two of these will hold something that's been welded here off the welding table so it's not rocking and you can clamp it down so that it stays in place while you weld. Now welding is one of these freaky processes where the hot glue is remarkable because it freezes so fast but it also shrinks when it freezes so if you weld something if I weld this to this and I weld it in here it's going to go like that and you need something to clamp it against so you can clamp two bits of steel together using one of these on the inside of the corner so let's say this is our bit of steel here and this is our other bit of steel I can clamp in here and like that and then I can put tacks in place where I want to weld and the tacks are really just clamps, right? That's why you tack something first, to stop it distorting in this way. Then you can remove the thing that you've clamped into place and finish welding it and Bob's your mother's brother. It's also good if you weld in a particular order to minimise distortion. So these things are so versatile. And let's say you need to do some precision assembly, like some precision welding of something. It needs to be properly flat, for, for example, okay? Most welding tables like particularly ghetto welding tables like mine or the floor of yo garage or something they're not flat okay they're not even close to aerospace flat but here's let's say this is the shittest surface on earth okay it's just a gravel floor in a shed which cannot hope to be anything like flat and you need to fabricate something up and it's got to be flat some 90 degree corner there's your precision flat surface, right? Because three points of contact define a plane. And in engineering, like in ghetto engineering, which is the only kind of engineering that I ever practice, you've got it's got to be flat enough. So three points, this is these are obviously not point surfaces, but close enough. And that means that whatever you sit here. And whatever you sit here, and when you weld those two things together, they're sitting on a properly flat, precision enough surface for the flatness of the surface not to be a factor in any distortion that happens when you put it together. So that's kind of brilliant. They've also got these 3816 UNC holes in them so you can clamp stuff to them, which gives you the projection of a flat surface around there. And that's kind of useful. And then because there's such a precision thing dimensionally, if you want something that's four inches high, there's a four inch high surface and there's a five inch high surface, there's a six inch high surface. If you want to clamp something down to the table on your drill press or your milling machine, and then you want to drill through it, but you don't want the drill to hit the table because it's a precision machine surface, then you just get your couple of shims or four shims, whatever, and you clamp whatever you've got to drill through there, and you drill through here, and there's no risk of hitting the table. So for all these reasons, one, two, three blocks, or the metric equivalent, 25, 50, 75 blocks, they're really useful, and everyone should have them in their kit, and they're dirt cheap. So, dude, what are you waiting for? And I know every machinist in the in the audience has had this brain explode because I'm suggesting that you use these on a welding table as shims and clamps for welding where they're subject to all that uh, spatter. But they're so cheap. Just buy 10 and put four on your welding table and have them as the rough as guts uh, quartet and then just leave the other six for best. You know, when you've got to do some actual machining that requires them not to be 
uh, to damage, then, you know, just do that. And the other thing is they're uh, carbon steel, so they're going to rust, although hardened and ground surfaces don't rust that much. Just, uh, you know, give them a bit of a squirt with some of that lanolin stuff or some WD and uh, leave them like that and they'll be right. And if you ever scratch one or damage one or it gets a bit of rust, just get a sharpening stone and just give them a gentle stone and you'll be back to precision enough for the ghetto. Let's put it that way. And if you ever damage one, <laughs> let me know how. But if you do and it gets, you know, properly damaged, just throw it away and go again because they're so cheap. Anyway, Chris Braid now. And now Chris is a budding young uh, electrophysicist by the sound of things. Brado! Brado says, rubbish, John. It's so dry here, he means in Australia, that you can't get a decent earth on the concrete by the pump. I can't say that I've ever heard of anyone suffering fuel ignition from filling their plastic petrol bottles and generating static. That's a false argument. D not hearing of something is not the same as a body of evidence suggesting that that doesn't happen. In fact, static electricity is the commonest cause of fires at petrol filling stations around the world. So there's that. Also, the carpet on the back of one truck and the wooden tray on the other don't complete a circuit to earth either. Well... <laughs> Brado, how is that degree in electrodynamics coming? Because let's say we've got three things, shall we? We've got the car, the container, whatever, the thing you're going to fill up, and we've got the fuel pump, and we've got you. I'm not talking about completing a circuit. We're talking about static electricity. So it's really important for the three things the car, the thing you're going to fill up, and pointy-headed you, to be at the same electrical potential. And Earth is just a concept. It's the point that we arbitrarily call zero, zero volts, relative to everything else in the space, okay? So the pump, let's say the pump is Earth, and let's say your car turns up and you're in it, and like me, you've been wearing your... Kill Bill, uh, Uma Thurman yellow spandex jumpsuit and you've been rubbing your buns of steel because you're a well-educated white middle-aged man <laughs> on your lambskin seat covers enjoying that white privilege all the way to filling the car up for your wife who won't have a bar of it. So you jump out and you're kind of charged up because the buns of steel have been exerting their yellow spandex badness on the lambswool seat cover and you get up and you're <laughs> quite charged up and you walk over to the pump and you touch the pump which is a good thing to be doing because <laughs> if you don't touch the pump you'll be at a much higher potential right so someone else hands the pump to you or they're over there filling the car up and you walk up and your buns of steel have been you know doing their thing then you'll discharge your static electricity into the vapor coming out of the whatever you're filling up and that's really bad in fact that's the mechanism of most fuel station disasters because kids get out of the car they want to see what mommy or daddy's doing and they walk up and they look up like this at the fuel filler and they put their hands up here and they discharge their static electricity onto the car right because they're charged up because you've got them wearing matching spandex friggin jumpsuit because you're not doing the right thing as a parent anyway that's kind of what happens so it's really important to equalize the potential you're not trying to make a circuit. You're not trying to get the earth at the same potential as everything else. But what you're trying to do is get the pump and you and whatever is being filled up at the same potential. It's extremely important to do that. And you've got to realise that a plastic container sitting on some of that all-weather carpet in the back of a boot of a car or the cargo bay of a wagon or some camper trailer or something of that nature. It can be just moving around like this. It's the same as your buns of steel and your yellow spandex on the lamb's wool, right? And what you've got to do is lift it up so you touch it, you equalise the potential with it, you put it on the ground, then you walk over here, you equalise your potential with the pump and it makes it much less likely that this static discharge will happen into a cloud of vapour that's coming out because 
if you open the top of the fuel container and then you get back in the car and rub your buns of steel on the lamb's wall and get out again, then that could be bad, is all I'm saying, right? That's why they took the, uh, the, the automatic lock. You know, you used to be able to lock the pumps on and they used to just run while the attendant at the server, remember them? While he went off and did other shit, checked your oil and that. Well, they took them off when consumers started auto-filling their own cars. And that was because it's bad for consumers to start the filling process, get back in the car, spandex, lamb's wool, get back out, grab the pump again, cloud of expanding highly explosive vapour just, you know, deflagrates all over their head, which is kind of bad. And it's a logical fallacy to say, well, I've never heard of that, therefore it doesn't happen. You know, if that's the way we're going to roll as a society, well, I've never heard of that. I've never seen anyone die of COVID kind of thing. That's not the same as nobody died of COVID, right? It's just not. Anyway, that's the static electricity thing. The outtake away, whatever, here is always get portable fuel containers and put them next to the pump before you fill them up. Don't leave them in the back of a station wagon or a sedan or something. Take them off the tray of the ute, put them on the concrete. It's much safer. And in the case of anything carpeted, there's a real danger if you spill any fuel on the carpet, right? So even if you just spill, you know, a teaspoon of fuel on the carpet, then you shut the boot. When you open the boot again, all of that fuel has evaporated off. Like the flash point of petrol is minus 60 degrees C or something. Anyway, it's colder than it'll ever be in ambient Australia. And that means it'll just spontaneously evaporate into a highly flammable vapour that deflagrates all over your face if there's a source of ignition. So... That's a bit of a concern. And Brado, I'd say brush up on your intellectual argument skills, dude, because they leave something to be desired. Now, Lee Donald is next, and Lee is a former TV producer, he tells me, and everyone. Everyone's a frustrated executive producer, but apparently Lee's got some runs on the board, so there's that. He wants to know if I can do a whole episode of the show without using the term, so there's that. So there's that. And wearing his producer's hat, he says to me, on every occasion, I would have to stop the pre-record and have you do it again without, all caps, must be shouting, without relying upon the effing phrase. So there's that. No, I don't think I can do that because... Uh, I just use that as a bit of a spack filler conversationally instead of going, uh, uh, uh. And, and this is the thing, right? When you're sitting on this side doing this, I'm not reading a fucking prompter, okay? I'm just talking to you off the cuff. It is difficult to talk for 30 minutes or something without stumbling. I've already stumbled half a dozen times and I used to try and invent creative ways of cutting them out. Now I just don't give a shit. I just do it. And if you don't like the odd stumble, then what you should do is balance that up against the authenticity of this being presented to you in one cut. Like, my father's in hospital at the moment, okay? So my phone is not on silent. If it rings, I'm going to answer it. And I am going to jump cut in between those bits because that's kind of important that I don't miss a call. And sometimes I get a courier and he comes and bangs on the front uh, roller door of the fat cave here and I just get up and do that and jump cut in between those. But the rest of the time, I just roll with it. Occasionally I watch the package in edit before I publish it and I go, oh, Jesus, that's a bit iffy. I might get sued for defamation for that and I cut that out as well. But everything else is off the gun. It's exactly how I think about it in the moment. And you need to have some turns of phrase that get you from this thought to the next one because sitting on that side where you are, that's easy. Watching is easy. Presenting is hard. And the skill is to kind of make it look easy right? And the thing about being in Australia is it's kind of cool to be a dumb, gibbering idiot in Australia. And it's not like that around the rest of the world. Like you can go to Chicago or LA or New York and you can mine your way down to the lowest socioeconomic parts of the community and you can interview people there and they'll give you remarkably articulate commentary on 
things that they know and understand, like the way their life is or the way the changes to an economy affect them and things of that nature. They can all go, yeah, well, blah, 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 blah. And they do it without stumbling and stuttering and all of that stuff. And you can get someone with 10 PhDs in Australia and you run a camera on them and they're going, oh, um, well, uh, well, you know, it's mainly just jibber. And I don't know what it is about the Australian psyche. I'm pretty sure that we don't make enough kids stand up in front of the rest of the class and actually speak. I'm pretty sure it's sort of rooted in that. Anyway, so no, Lee, sorry, dude, you don't have to watch. That's the best solution for you. I I don't give a shit if you watch or not. (laughs) It's a character flaw. Now, Rodolfo Lopez, Lopey, Lopey has a view about that miraculous Tesla escape. You know where that family went over the brink in California and they, the car flipped and they rode the roller coaster down a cliff called Devil's Anus or whatever it's called, and uh, they survived. Dad was charged with attempted murder and it was a pretty grim situation, but at least it wasn't a horrifically tragic uh, one where innocent people lost their lives. And it was, in a sense, miraculous, but I hate that term because miraculous points to divine intervention and I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think there's just good luck and bad luck, right? And anyway, Lopey goes... Lucky? I humbly disagree. To me, it was the result of a given set of circumstances, physics and engineering. Does it matter if it was a Tesla? Not at all. A miracle? No. Am I glad they survived? Definitely. So, Lopey's pretty harmless. But plenty of people, and the media's terrible at this, they call these things miracles, right? There's just good luck and bad luck. And you know, there's good luck and bad luck everywhere. Soldiers in combat, like you read stories, memoirs written by soldiers who've been to Afghanistan, whatever, and they've seen this sort of frontline action. I once interviewed a guy who was in Afghanistan, Damien, it'll come to me. Anyway, he lost both legs to an IED. And he was a remarkable guy. And he, he talked about the, the, all of the things he did. He was a commander, Tomlinson. Damien Tomlinson. I interviewed him and, uh, you know, he woke up. It was a pretty grim situation. He ro- he woke up in the aftermath of being blown up in this way. He's lost both his legs. One of his mates, a medic, was essentially taping his balls to what was left of his thigh. This is almost a direct quote of the story he told me. And then he recovered from that and he was given pretty good health care and he's on prosthetic legs and as you do in this situation when you're a badass mother lover like that he went on and walked the Kokoda Trail and I've gone Jesus dude you know I suppose you didn't have to worry about getting trench foot and he just laughed right and this is ultimate not playing the victim card to me he just laughed and he said no and my legs never got tired either (laughs) kind of thing and I thought what a remarkable mindset you know and he kept talking about luck right the whole thing was luck there's good luck and there's bad luck and I guess anyone who suffers really bad luck in these kinds of extreme environments and situations they don't get to write their memoirs right the people who come back and write their memoirs they're intrinsically lucky in a sense so anyway there's luck There's good luck and bad luck, but there's no miracles. And the media should hang its head in shame for calling anything a miracle. It's just lucky. So, Anon, Anon, now, Anon, Anon. Anon, Anon says, My son is currently a second-year radiography student undertaking clinical placement in an emergency department. Within the first week of his placement, a fellow student was assaulted by a drunken or drugged-up patient. The hospital staff told the kids to go buy tactical torches to defend themselves. Thus, your point about self-defence is certainly real and relatable. So there's a lot to unpack here about the torch thing, and I got a couple of other comments about torches as well, and I'll just... If you'll excuse me, I'll just grab a prop so that we can talk about that. So there's that. So this is a uh, Warrior 3S. It's one of those torches that's currently on sale and probably the the biggest 
EDC torch that I would ever think about carrying. I actually carry this smaller one, the Warrior Mini 2, okay? And I'm not just trying to fit a sponsor into the editorial part of the segment. There's a point to be made about these tactical, so-called tactical torches, right? They're probably the best, quote-unquote, they're not really a self-defence weapon. They're not a weapon at all, but they are defensive in the sense that they can defuse an attacker, right? Because in the car park at night in a hospital, it's almost Hollywood, isn't it? That's That scenario has been presented on film numerous times. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the dynamics of violence because we see it in Hollywood where it's a stylized version, fictional version of what could be a relatable real situation. And the first thing that people get wrong is when are they in a fight? Right, People think that it's when someone gets their hands on you or throws the first punch. That's not when you're in a fight. When you're in a fight, like if you talk to people who take after-action statements, like uh, police officers who interview the victims of crime, what will often happen is someone will say, I knew there was something off about this situation. I knew there was something wrong about that guy. Right, And they've got blood all over their face or something and their noses over here. And that's when you're in a fight. That's when it starts. That's the moment you need to think like it's a fight. Okay, so if you're a young person in this situation, you're walking through a hospital car park when you come off shift at 2 a.m. or something, and there's some dodgy loser who goes bing and acquires you as a potential target because you paid attention at school and you're not that athletic looking and you look a bit timid, then you're sort of ticking every box for your application to be a victim, okay? So don't look like that. Look confident, hold your head up, look around, be situationally aware. Although situational awareness, I don't think that's a real problem. Most people are aware of their situation, but they like to play this game of pretending with themselves when they're actually under threat. They say, oh, that looks a bit dodgy, but I'll hope for the best. And we've got rules and he's probably nice like me. And guess what? A violent motherfucker does not think like you. He thinks like a violent motherfucker. And if you're not one, you probably can't relate to that. So you need to get this cloak of civility and you need to take it off at the point where you think this might be dodgy. That means get your hand on your torch, get it out because it can't hurt, right? If you're wearing a bag across your chest or something that will impede your movement if you have to defend yourself, get it off your chest. Put it on one shoulder so you can drop it and move. Like, these things are important and you can't do it after the first shot gets fired. That's kind of important. So you get your torch ready and then if violent motherfucker has a crack at you or interviews you, blast them, right? That is the gentlest way to defuse this situation. A torch is not a weapon. And, like, as a weapon, it's the world's shittest weapon. It's almost up there with a coubaton, right? But you can hold one. And if you know how to defend yourself, you can do everything with a torch in your hand that you could do jabbing, crossing, hooking, uppercutting, whatever, right? You can do that. So that's kind of convenient. And in between melees of this nature you can just ensure that the dude who is potentially going to assault you and worst case scenario, throw you down the stairs where you get a brain injury and live the rest of your life as a virtual cripple, but completely aware, living hell, um, you can sort of prevent that from happening in the gentlest possible way, is what I'm saying. But as a weapon, torches are nowhere, but as a deterrent, they are 11 out of 10, as far as I'm concerned. I want to get into a couple of other questions like this, because a couple of people, uh, C. Nile and Brian Hynett, they made to uh, points about these tactical, so-called tactical torches as well, right? C. Nile goes, get it, C. Nile? Tactical torches allow you to quickly summon strobe mode, rapid pulses of turbo brightness, which not only temporarily blinds the intruder slash assailant, but disorients them to the point that they may lack coordination, giving you time to flee to safety. Who doesn't want that? Bring on strobe mode. And Brian Hynett, I.O., says, surprised you didn't show the strobe, much more disorienting in an orc 
awkward situation. I think he means when you might have to fight for your freaking life, perhaps facing away from the camera. Okay, so two things about that, okay. Strobe mode is a thing. If you're an epileptic, look away now. That's strobe mode, right? <sighs> Here's the problem with strobe mode. You pull out your torch. You've got to hold it like this. Let's say you pull it out like this, okay? You've got to rotate it around and find the button. And then you've got to give it three presses to invoke strobe mode. And then if you have to defend yourself, it's facing the wrong way. So strobe mode is a marketing gimmick. And the people who advocate strobe mode for defensive purposes have never been in a situation where they've actually had to defend themselves. It just sounds like a good idea. You know, the closest they've been to a frickin' dojo even is sitting on a sweaty couch in the basement with a keyboard going, oh, use strobe mode. That's up there with, oh, just run away. <laughs> right? Running away doesn't work, okay? Because if I run away from somebody in their 30s, I'm probably going to get 50 metres or 100 metres. And if we're the same sort of fitness, they're going to be on top of me because 30 years difference in age. And then I'm going to turn around and they're going to push me. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to be gassed, more gassed than them. And then I've got to do it there, right? So fuck that. Do it where it starts, where you're not gassed, where you've got maximum chance of winning. Like, it's, it's that. And this business about strobe mode... If you're not used to having to defend yourself at all, then you are going to be massively stressed in this situation. Someone gets missile lock on you and they come for you. That is hugely stressful. Your endocrine system is going to respond, right? Your adrenal glands are going to go and fill your blood up in seconds with cortisol and noradrenaline. And as a result of that, your peripheral vision is going to go, which is why it's so friggin' hard to check six in this situation. You're not motivated to do that. You're motivated to look at the threat. And then you're going to vasoconstrict at your extremities, which means you're going to lose your fine motor control. That's done so that you won't bleed to death as quickly if you get massively injured. So evolution's done a good job there, but it's not very helpful if you have to look down here with someone closing the gap on you and rotate the torch around, find the button, and then give it three precise press it's like we're already in fantasy land if you think you can do that this and the strobe mode is not significantly more disorienting than just that and doing this is easy because the torch comes out you've just got to find the back with your thumb you blast them and then if you've got a fight it's already there in the right location that's why a tactical torch is designed in this way and you kind of can't have strobe mode just on the back of the tail switch continuously because sometimes you just need a really bright light to look over there and strobe mode is entirely unhelpful when you're trying to search for someone or something and you never know when you might have to do that either like you might be walking along the foreshore somewhere and some drunk idiot might fall into the ocean and you need to try and identify where they are and see if you can help and strobe mode's not much help there and then they're getting sucked out in the current and you're going how do I get out of strobe mode again is it two presses or three and which you know like it's too hard Okay, strobe mode is a complete gimmick. It's too hard to get operational under pressure and it doesn't help that much anyway. What really helps in that Hollywood moment where you're that poor young kid who's being attacked in a car park is to know when it's on. And it's on much earlier than when they get on top of you and go hands on. You've got time. If you throw away the cloak of civility and react now, when there's plenty of time, you can be ready. And my strong advice is also to go and learn something like boxing. If you think you're at risk of this kind of thing, Muay Thai, boxing, kickboxing, karate, it's all the same. Like All the purists go, Bleh! head explodes. It's all the friggin' same. A jab is a jab, a cross is a cross, a hook is a hook, and an elbow is a frickin' elbow. There are minor variations philosophically between all of those martial arts, but the reason you want to do it, and you want to do it for at least six months, is so that if something happens, like you get hit from behind, okay? 
let's say someone just pushes you from behind and slams you into a car, you're going to be a bit groggy and you're in this thing called an OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide and act. And your attacker is already at act, okay? So you're playing this massive game of catch up and you're really behind the eight ball as a consequence because you haven't even observed it yet. You're, you're, you've observed your face going into a car and you're turning around. The difference between somebody who's had six to 12 months worth of martial arts training and someone who hasn't is that someone who hasn't is like, oh, like this. Someone who's been trained comes up like this. They're already chin down, elbows in, hands up. And that just makes you harder to hurt. And if you've got the torch in your pocket, you can get it and it's up and you're ready, right? And that's why this stuff is it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. If you want to be safe in these dodgy environments, a torch is a good thing to have. But it's only a component in what is something that you've got to arrange for yourself, which is an integrated protection package. And that's on you, dude. You just have to get that training, know that stuff, and work it all out. And everyone's got a view like, oh, strobe mode. Strobe mode's a freaking joke, whereas really bright light is turning the lights out for your opponent without beating their brains out on, a gr on the ground and spending the next 12 months in court defending your actions as fair, reasonable, balanced, whatever, and having the opposing team try and rip you apart endlessly and losing the house because that's what legal representation costs. Now... At the risk of bringing the whole thing into a miraculously uplifting piece of dialogue now. Otto H. Dowie says, Highly reflective paper is messing with auto exposure of your camera. If your camera has a real auto, a real aerial, I think he means, aerial area auto exposure, use that or manual. Manual may blow the paper. Dude, I worked as a photographer for 10 years and I spent 20 years in television, so give me some credit. I'm not using auto exposure. Look at this. Half of the frame just went white and yet the exposure of the background didn't change. See? Not changing. Still not changing. Still not changing. Still not changing. The paper's just bright and it blows out when I move it close to the light. The light's just there. It's just, the light's just here, right? That's what I'm looking at. <laughs> Amazing. So, let me just line up the world again. Otherwise, it'd be dogs and cats living together at the end of the video. Right. So, thanks for the advice, Otto, but I'm already not using auto exposure. Dude. And finally, David Stewart. Stewie says... Do you have to talk like a news reader? Two words, news reader. It's actually one word, Stewie, but it doesn't make me trust you. Well, two points on that, Stewie. I don't talk like a news reader. None of this talk has been like a news reader because a news reader doesn't talk to you like we're having a conversation down the pub, which is exactly how I talk to you. And I also don't talk like a news reader because hopefully when I talk to you, you have some idea about what I actually think about this and that. And that is absolutely something that you never get from a news reader. You never get that. They're just reading the script, right? You, they're, they're not thinking at all except thinking about the inflections and where the sentences end and hoping the person driving the auto cue is doing a decent job, blah, blah, blah. Hoping like hell the auto cue doesn't go down because, oh my God, if I had to fill 30 seconds or 90 seconds of a, bro a broadcast, I'd be fucked. That's terrifying for your average news reader. The other thing is, Stewie, I don't really give three craps who you trust and who you don't. The simplest solution is if you don't like my delivery, and I do speak in sentences, and I do use the punctuation when I speak with commas and pauses and things of that nature, I try and construct my thoughts in cogent blocks and deliver them according to the rules of grammar for when you speak. But if that's speaking like a newsreader and being untrustworthy, then okay. There's plenty of people who just gibber and word vomit on YouTube and I'd suggest just go and find one of them, dude. Anywho, for everybody who is not featured in the uh, nutfest section of... Uh, 
this fine channel. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got something from it. The one, two, three blocks, I'll have a link in the description to them. So everyone needs at least four of those. Even if you don't know that you need them, you need them. And when you get them, you'll hardly ever put them down, dude. They're just, they're even just great for holding the plans the plans, which in my case usually means just a bit of paper with some random dimensions written on them. But they stop them blowing away in the breeze and everything. They're a high-tech miracle. And if you don't own one, two, three blocks, that's pretty easy to fix. So anyway, thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one.